can imagine if people could vote, as there was a big movement that almost succeeded almost 100 years ago in this country, if people had to vote before they could start another war, if people had to vote on whether to continue wars, if people got to vote on whether to open a new base or close a new base or give weapons to certain dictatorships or so-called democracies, or on whether militaries should have absolute immunity, which they do. I don't think everyone would agree with me on everything. I don't think a majority would agree with me on everything. But I think we would be dramatically better off uh, if we were actually using democracy for foreign policy rather than doing foreign policy in the name of democracy. We would be dramatically better off. Um, so, uh, so I, I'm looking forward to questions and answers and discussion and, and civil disagreement. I've been told that questions have to wait till the end. Uh, so I will try to get through some prepared remarks and then get to that. Uh, but if we can do civil discussion and friendly disagreement, uh, rather than name calling and accusations of working for this or that foreign dictator, you know, this is both what we have to do and what the governments that are in conflicts need to do instead of war. I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet that has a little pledge. It's two sentences. It essentially says, I want to end all wars. Uh, people have signed this in 194 countries. We're trying to get to 195. We're already way above the 175 that you have to thank the troops for watching the sports events on, on TV, where the <laughs> Pentagon has people in 175. We passed that mark long ago. Anyway, sign this Declaration of Peace and pass it along if you are so inclined. The typical, the typical response in the United States to the gradual buildup to a war or even the launching of a war or even the launching of a war that is reported on U.S. corporate media is absolutely nothing different. Work, school, shopping, sports, movies. Among those who have some response, it's typically based on their understanding of the particular war, shaped largely by corporate media, by the political party of the U.S. president at the time, which makes waging wars in the name of democracy even stranger, by the accumulated months or decades of related propaganda in the culture at large, and by the nature of the war itself, typically understood as if human history had begun the day the war began. Some people thought it was especially greedy when President Biden asked Congress a few weeks ago for unfathomable piles of money for four wars at once. Even though he asks for ten times as much every year for preparations for unspecified wars. I thought it made perfect sense. The chances of any particular Congress member finding the decency, opposing the media, opposing the legalized bribes, slamming shut the revolving door, and saying no to a single war is very small. The chances of any Congress member saying no to four wars at once is dramatically smaller. Even a Congress member who claims to oppose three out of four wars would be likely to vote yes on such a bill because their war support is typically far stronger than their war opposition. If you're wondering which four wars, it was Ukraine, Israel, and even though it's not a war yet, Taiwan, plus what might as well be a war in U.S. infotainment, the border of Mexico. <laughs> typically, public opinion polls insist on a yes or a no, even if people haven't got a clue or really don't care. And typically, polls are worded in favor of wars. But for what they are worth, in polls you typically see a majority in the U.S. support any new war for some months, even a year and a half or so, after which a majority says that war never should have been begun. When there are U.S. troops in the war, a majority can say it never should have been begun and simultaneously say it should be continued indefinitely because through some twisted logic it helps that tiny percentage of those already dead who were from the United States to get more people from the United States killed. But in those cases where the wars just involve mountains of U.S. weapons paid for by U.S. taxpayers, then when a majority says a war never should have been begun, it also says it should be ended. With Iraq and Afghanistan, it took many years for it never should have been begun to become it should be ended. 
With the latest burst of violence in Israel and Palestine, a U.S. majority opposed sending weapons from day one, at least in some polls that asked about weapons rather than aid. With Ukraine, a majority supported sending weapons after the Russian invasion, since when we've moved slowly to fewer and fewer people wanting to keep sending more weapons, even though the weapons are often combined with humanitarian aid and referred to simply as aid. But none of this indicates a deep growth in understanding as to why a particular war, uh, as to why a particular war was and is wrong, much less why every war is wrong. The most impressive propaganda feat I have ever seen, more than the days after 9-11, more than ISIS videos, more than Russiagate, was what was done in the days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Of course, it took zero effort to depict an evil, immoral, illegal, mass murderous invasion as something bad. And it turned out not to be difficult at all to do what they call humanizing of war victims. After two decades of endless wars, one might have been forgiven for wondering. But nope, it was no trouble at all to tell the stories of victims, as we've been imploring corporate media outlets to do for all of these years. But the media coverage went beyond these basics. It very powerfully erased all context and history, applied the label the unprovoked war to the most obviously provoked war in some time, built on Russiagate to demonize Russia as the single Hitlerized individual of one name, Putin, and above all created the moral urgency to do something, combined with the long established doctrine that the only thing one can do when doing something is needed is war. In a matter of days, the United States changed from a place where a random stranger would be unlikely to be able to tell you a single thing about Ukraine, to a place where random strangers accosted you regarding the urgency to support the war effort in Ukraine. That is impressive. It's impressive at the level of how Nazis were influenced by reading US books on public relations. You can be sure all manipulators of opinion are watching and learning. On top of that, the first voices allowed in corporate media opposing sending piles of weapons to go to other wars or, uh, the, sorry, the, the first voices allowed in corporate media opposing sending these piles of free weapons to Ukraine were right-wing voices who wanted the weapons to go to other wars or wanted to selfishly hoard wealth in their own corner of the globe rather than doing what they joined in calling aiding Ukraine. The media quickly defined favoring peace as agreeing with those people. So when Henry Kissinger said, y'all are getting a little too war crazy for me, that wasn't a giant fire alarm in the study hall. It was just confirmation that peace was the territory of the right-wing warmongers. The war sales pitch for the latest war on Gaza was radically less successful than the marketing of the war in Ukraine. In a matter of hours, there were larger peace rallies in US streets for peace in Palestine than there had been for peace in Ukraine in over a year and a half. Those who agreed with every US corporate media outlet on Ukraine imagined that Ukraine had no choice other than war. Whether or not one ignored the years of building up toward war and the waging of a smaller scale war, whether or not one paid any attention to the perfectly reasonable proposals for peace from Russia, rudely rejected by the US government, including that of December 2021, Russia was now invading and there was a need to do something and do something means war. Of course, do something could mean unarmed civilian resistance, Ukraine was a million miles away from doing that something. It would have been utterly unreasonable, unrealistic, unfamiliar, shocking, and not the least bit respectable to mention in any well-funded institution for Ukraine to have employed massive unarmed resistance. But it would have been wiser. Even without the years of investment and preparation that would have been ideal and might have deterred the invasion, for the Ukrainian government and its allies to have put everything into unarmed resistance at the moment of invasion would have been a smarter move. Unarmed resistance has been used 
Coups and dictators have been nonviolently ousted in dozens of places. An unarmed army helped liberate India. In 1997, unarmed peacekeepers in Bougainville succeeded where armed ones had failed. In 2005, in Lebanon, Syrian domination was ended through nonviolent uprising. In 1923, the French occupation of Germany was ended through nonviolent resistance. Between 87 and 91, nonviolent resistance drove the Soviet Union out of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, and the latter established plans for future unarmed resistance. Ukraine had nonviolently ended Soviet rule in 1990. Some of the tools of unarmed resistance are familiar from 1968 when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia. In fact, in polls in Ukraine prior to the Russian invasion, not only did people know what unarmed resistance was, but more of them favored it than favored military resistance to an invasion. When the invasion happened, there were hundreds of incidents of Ukrainians using unarmed resistance, stopping tanks, etc. Unarmed civilians kept the Russian military away from the Zaporizhzhia nuclear plant without a single death, whereas handing the job over to the National Guard resulted in an immediate takeover by the Russians who fired even on a nuclear plant once there were armed troops to fire at. There was near media silence on early unorganized and unsupported attempts at unarmed resistance. What if the attention paid to Ukrainian war heroes had been paid to Ukrainian unarmed resistor heroes? What if the world of people who want peace had been invited to join in the unarmed resistance and the billions spent on weapons had been spent on that? What if Ukrainians had been asked to host international protectors, people like us with and without any training, rather than to flee their country or join the war? People would have been killed, and for some reason those deaths would have been deemed far worse. But they would very likely have been far fewer. The veto, as Zelensky later proposed, asked the UN to oversee a new vote in Crimea on whether to rejoin Russia, joined the International Criminal Court, or, and asked it to investigate Donbass, etc. Russia could have cut off trade rather than causing the West to do that. That either side needed only a limited effort to achieve a satisfactory agreement is demonstrated by the fact that they had one in Minsk too, and by the fact that outside pressure has been brought to bear to prevent one in the early days of the war and ever since. The disastrous course chosen by both sides may end in a nuclear apocalypse or in a compromise agreement. In the highly unlikely event that it ends in the overthrow of the Ukrainian or Russian government, or even in territorial lines that don't roughly correspond to what local residents might have voted for without war, it won't end at all. At this point, some observable action must precede negotiations. Either side could announce a ceasefire and ask that it be matched. Either side could announce a willingness to agree to a particular agreement. Russia did this prior to the invasion and was ignored. Such an agreement would include removal of all foreign troops, neutrality for Ukraine, autonomy for Crimea and Donbass, demilitarization and lifting sanctions. Such a proposal by either side would be strengthened by the announcement that it would be using and building its capacity to use unarmed resistance against any violation of a ceasefire. Some people have done a better job of opposing both sides of the fighting in Palestine without necessarily understanding where that wisdom should lead. The Western obsession with World War II, mischaracterized into a justification for war making, has actually done more for support of Ukrainian war making than Israeli war making. So carefully has Vladimir Putin been made into the latest Hitler that an assumption has developed that anyone who ever fought against Russians was on the side of good, even if that includes Nazis who fought for the original Hitler. In my book, Leaving World War II Behind, I debunk many of the myths surrounding World War II and thereby driving militarism today. With Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu hell-bent on genocide, people keep sharing a scandalous article from 2015 that was called Netanyahu, Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews. I am afraid it may give people the wrong idea. Netanyahu's lie was that a Muslim cleric from Palestine convinced Hitler to kill Jews.
But when Netanyahu said that Hitler originally wanted to expel Jews, not murder them, he was telling the indisputable truth. The problem is that it wasn't a Muslim cleric who convinced Hitler otherwise, and it isn't any secret who it was. It was the world's governments. It's incredible that this remains unknown, as it similarly remains unknown that World War II could easily have been avoided by a wiser ending of World War I. Yes. Or that Nazism drew on U.S. inspiration for eugenics, segregation, concentration camps, poison gas, public relations, one-armed salutes. Or that U.S. corporations armed Nazi Germany through the war. Or that the U.S. military hired many top Nazis at the end of the war. Or that Japan tried to surrender prior to the nuclear bombings. Or that there was major resistance to the war in the United States. Or that the Soviets did the vast bulk of defeating the Germans. Or that U.S. public at the time knew what the Soviets were doing, which created a momentary break in two centuries of hostility to Russia in U.S. politics. Opposing war making in Ukraine today is not a minor issue. Nothing in my lifetime has done more to increase the risk of nuclear apocalypse than the war in Ukraine. Nothing is doing more to impede global cooperation on climate, poverty, or homelessness. Few things are doing as much direct damage in those areas, devastating the environment, disrupting grain shipments, creating millions of refugees, while casualties in Iraq were heatedly disputed in U the U.S. media for years, there is widespread acceptance that casualties in Ukraine are already over half a million. There is no way to precisely count how many lives could have been saved around the world by investing hundreds of billions in something wiser than this war. But a fraction of that could end starvation on Earth. No matter what you think of how the war in Ukraine began, or when it began, or which of the two sides is cartoonishly deserving of all of the blame, we now have endless stalemate. We now, for God's sake, have the commander-in-chief of the army in Ukraine saying it's World War I and it's a hopeless stalemate. And President Zelensky saying, not you're wrong, not that's mistaken, not that's incorrect, but you need to shut up. Years of killing are yet to come, or nuclear war, or compromise. Well-meaning people want to do what they can to help Ukraine, but the millions of Ukrainians who have fled and those who have stayed to face prosecution for peace activism look wiser every day. We're told to listen to the Ukrainians and respect the Ukrainians' right to defend themselves and allow the Ukrainians' agency but how can we know the views of Ukrainians when so many have fled and everyone else can face criminal prosecution if they support peace? But the U.S. government denies the Ukrainian government the right to make peace. Gerhard Schroeder, former German chancellor, says in agreement with numerous other reports, quote, during the peace talks in March 2022 in Istanbul, Ukrainians did not agree to peace because they were not allowed to. They had to coordinate everything they talked about with the Americans first, end quote. While the U.S. government can perhaps deny Ukraine various rights, I certainly cannot. I can only offer it advice and have it rejected by cries that I am denying someone's rights. And as to agency, why not allow Ukraine the agency to manufacture its own weapons? Why not allow Israel and Egypt and the rest of the world the same agency? Peace might arrive more quickly than we've dreamed if we started handing out that much agency. Peace is viewed by some on both sides of the war in Ukraine, many of them quite far removed from the fighting, not as a good thing, but as even worse than ongoing slaughter and devastation. Both sides insist on total victory, but that total victory is nowhere in sight as other voices on both sides quietly admit. And any such victory would not be lasting as the defeated side would plot vengeance as soon as possible. Compromise is a difficult skill. We teach it to toddlers, but not to governments. Traditionally, a refusal to compromise, even if it kills us, has more appeal on the political right. But political party means everything in US politics. And the president? is a Democrat. <laughs>
So what is a liberal thinking person to do? I would suggest a heavy dose of independent thinking. Nearly two years of peace proposals from around the globe almost all include the same elements. Removal of foreign troops, neutrality for Ukraine, autonomy for Crimea and Donbas, demilitarization, lifting sanctions. Either side could announce its intention to uphold an agreement. If a ceasefire isn't matched, the slaughter could be quickly resumed. If a ceasefire is used to build up troops and weapons for the next battle, well then, the sky is also blue and a bear does it in the woods. Nobody imagines either side as capable of switching off the war business that quickly. A ceasefire is required for negotiations and an end to weapons shipments is required for a ceasefire. These three elements must come together and they could be abandoned together if negotiations fail, but why not try? Allowing the people of Crimea and Donbas to determine their own fate is a real sticking point for Ukraine. And as some have already pointed out to me here in this room, this evening is not a simple question as populations in these places have changed and been changed by governments. But that solution strikes me as a bigger victory for democracy than sending more U.S. weapons to Ukraine despite the opposition in some polls of the majority of the people of the United States. Why is it not a triumph for democracy to allow people to determine their own futures rather than waging wars to prevent that? Why isn't war itself the enemy of democracy rather than its protector? If both sides of every war are engaged in immoral outrages, if the problem is not whichever side you've been trained to hate, but war itself, and if war itself is the biggest drain on resources desperately needed, thereby killing more people indirectly than directly, and if war itself is the reason we are at risk of nuclear Armageddon, and if war itself is a leading cause of bigotry and the sole justification for government secrecy and a major cause of environmental destruction and the big impediment to global cooperation, and if you've understood that governments do not train their populations in unarmed defense, not because it doesn't work as well as militarism, but because they are afraid of their populations, then you are now a war abolitionist. And it's time we get to work. Not saving our weapons for a more proper war, not arming the world to protect us from one club of oligarchs getting richer than another club of oligarchs, but ridding the world of wars, of war plans, of war tools, and of war thinking. I'll stop there. Thank you.